You're listening to Bad Dog Agility, bringing you training tips, interviews, and news about the great sport of dog agility. I'm Jennifer. I'm Esteban. And I'm Sarah. And this is episode 245. Today's podcast is brought to you by hitaboard.com. Hitaboard.com has the innovative training tools you need for agility. Having problems with a dog walker A-frame? The Hitaboard can fix that. Your dog doesn't like tugging? They'll love the tug it. Can't move your A-frame around by yourself? The move it can. Go to hititboard.com and use discount code BDA10 to get 10% off your order. That's hititboard.com. Today's podcast is also brought to you by 1TDC.com. Dog agility can be hard on your dog's body. Help keep their joints and muscles healthy with 1TDC. 1-tetradecanol complex is a clinically studied blend of unique fatty acid oils that can support your dog's joint health. 1TDC promotes a healthy inflammatory response from head to tail. All of our listeners will automatically qualify for a great 1TDC special offer by purchasing online at BDA1TDC.com. That's BDA, the number one, TDC.com. Today, uh, we looks like we are embarking on the second annual interview with Dan Shaw, since he is the 2020 Crufts Championship winner. He was the 2019 Crufts Championship winner, and so we had him on uh, almost exactly a year ago to get today. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Dan, and congrats on your repeat victory. Thank you, and thank you for having me here again. The first thing I want to ask is, how many times have we had Dave Munnings on here? Because do you need question. to be on here a third time? Do you need to win this one more time yeah, to I firmly have, establish yourself as the finest that Britain has to offer? I want to have more interviews with him. So I'm going to keep winning so I can win this competition. There you go. I think that's <laughs> the motivation that, that, that drives you, you know, as yeah, jelly competitors. Yeah, this is the only reason I'm trying to win. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, it's so fantastic. You know, um, there's obviously a lot going on in the world right now with the uh, coronavirus situation and there in the UK, I know that there was a little bit of controversy going forward with uh, Crufts even, right? They had a case pop up in that city and decided to go ahead and hold the event. And then as soon as the event was done, they shut everything down, right? In, the, mm-hmm. in that city, in that facility. And uh, what was it like dealing with the uncertainty or was everything kind of all systems go green light everyone was going forward and people were not really that worried about it obviously now everybody's worried about it but right tell tell us a little bit about what it was like right there at the beginning you're trying to get ready to defend this title all these great dogs are here to compete what was that like um i think the week before crafts was kind of our last safe week in that none of us thought it was really going to hit how it has now. So there was a couple of speculations, maybe Crafts won't go ahead, they'd cancelled some other really big events. Um, But it it hadn't really crossed our minds that they would cancel. So I still trained as normal and just assumed that everything was going to go ahead as normal. Uh, I would say the only big difference that we had at Crafts was the spectators were really down. Normally they queue for like four hours maybe to get into the main arena. And I think this year they just had to queue for two hours to get into the main arena. So I would say it was much quieter. Yeah, I mean, this is, to put this in perspective, uh, because it feels like a lifetime ago in, in terms of how different the world is today versus then, but this was March 5th to March 8th. So yeah, it's like um, two weeks ago. Right, two weeks ago. Uh, and yeah, and things Cross were significantly different. is the biggest different. dog show in the world. Yep. And if it's not the biggest, it's certainly the greatest. <laughs> right, so the greatest dog show in the world, certainly. Um, yeah, that well, that's that's pretty interesting. And so, how many days of competition uh, w- was there for uh, you and your dog specifically? Like, how many of those days are you out there competing in agility? Uh, so, Crofts is on for four days, uh, and it's possible to qualify for all four days. Uh, I qualified for three of the days. The only day we didn't qualify for was the international day. Uh, and to qualify for international day, you have to win Olympia. And uh, we didn't qualify for Olympia this year, so that wasn't possible. So we had British Open, um, Team, Craft Singles, and uh, the Craft Championship. Oh, wow. Okay, I did not know that about Olympia. So is it okay for me to ask what happened with Olympia? Uh, So (laughs) our Olympia tryout days were... The last year of competing has been crazy. Nothing's gone easy. Um, so our Olympia tryout days, we had the worst weather ever, 
like just rain, rain, rain and more rains. So they ended up moving it to a different location uh, mm-hmm. on the day that it was meant to be. Uh, and the, the final happened at something like 6 p.m. By this point, uh, I'd kind of lost the will to live. So I, I got myself up for the competition, but the mental state really wasn't good. So we got eliminated. So we didn't qualify for Olympia, but I took the positive. Um, Olympia happens in December and I like my dogs to have a big winter break. So Geek had a big winter break uh, and was ready for crafts. We'll see. I think that strategy paid off here. Yeah. So you had a <laughs> tremendous weekend. Sarah was, uh, Sarah had sent me your uh, videos, your compilation r- runs from Cross, and she said you were seven out of seven. Yep. Seven of seven, right? Yeah. Seven of seven clean runs. Flawless. Yeah. Such a good boy. Flawless. Yeah. I think that's one of the, the hallmarks of, of watching Geek Run is um, everything just seems so... Uh, in the right spot. He's always in the right spot. Uh, One thing that I wanted to give you real credit for is, you know, a lot of times we see dogs that are amazing and dogs that are doing everything right. But I felt like you as the handler were everywhere you needed to be. Like, I felt like if I were geek, like uh, I would run that course clean too. I give geek credit for all the bars, right? Like (laughs) he's amazing at keeping all the bars And turning, phenomenal turner. And turning. But I felt like um, you were just, every single place you needed to be and you just made the course obvious. You know, there, there are obviously some really good um, independent skills like the weaves and, and a couple of other spots, but mostly it was you as a handler telling him exactly where to go very, very clearly. We're at such a cool point in our career, Geek 7 now. So for me, he's like maybe coming to the end of his prime this year and next year. I, I hope he'll still be up there. But we're at a really cool point where I know him so well. He knows me so well. I get to the start line with him and it just feels so easy. We can kind of predict each other's moves really well. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's so noticeable because with, with my young dog, uh, his daughter, she's three, I get onto the start line and I'm like, oh my word, what the hell is going <laughs> to happen here? So when I get geek, I'm like, oh, relax. He's been to all these big events before um, and he's just such a chill dog. It makes life so easy to run him. He's so predictable. Yeah, it's funny easy. you talk about um, being relaxed because that's what I was going to comment on with regard to watching your runs. It's like they're very soothing. Like I watch your runs <laughs> and I relax and I'm like, wow, this is so effortless and calming. Where You know, sometimes you see these big competitions and nerves and everything's very frantic and your, help, your heart rate elevates getting nervous. And that doesn't happen when I watched those runs from Cross. It was very smooth. <laughs> oh, I'm pleased you think so. Because I watched <laughs> the videos back and I was like, how was he faster than some of the dogs that, that were also clear? But I think it's just his smooth movement. It just eats the ground up. Man, right. Let's talk a little bit about that because I watched the final. Uh, I uh, watched it this morning and it was uh, phenomenal. Like you said, some of those dogs are incredible. You can see the ground speed that they possess. Phenomenal. Uh, and it, it was not lost on me that there were multiple dogs with running contacts. And so as a, as a refresher, as a reminder for people who may not remember from last year's podcast, Geek does not have running contacts. Is that correct? Right. Yeah, like you're slowing him down. Coming. All three. Yeah. Stopped on all three. Stopped on all three. Right. Yeah. Super and so that was the other thing. So, you know, I remember that when I saw the dog walk, I was like, Oh yeah. Okay. They, that's right. They don't have running contacts. And then I saw the a frame and I said, okay, they definitely don't, you know, they're kind of, like this is not a dog who's running this a frame in, in the same way that running contacts dogs do and still winning, which was phenomenal. I think a lot of that is, uh, you know, everything that we've talked about, certainly um, the turns I think are, are a very big deal. Some of these dogs with incredible ground speed are not getting the turns anywhere near that, that uh, geek is geek is literally making the course shorter by, you know, chopping out some of that yardage, you know, just going one yard long. It's not just the one yard you carry, it's the one yard you got to come back. So it's really two yards, right? Right. So, uh, you know, the, the things that Geek does on course is, is uh, really remarkable. But so the competition, these dogs, I just said, are phenomenal, but the handlers were also really good. I feel like the level of handling, at least among the elite cross level competitors in the UK, has really changed in the last, I want to say, two years. You know, it's yeah. probably longer than that, but, but what crazy. are your thoughts on that? Yeah. We had 24 dogs, I think, that have won championship tickets this year, which takes them through to the Crafts Championship. And every single one of those partnerships was capable of winning uh, that event. 
And I, I don't know whether that could have been said five or six years ago. The dogs um, are getting faster and faster and faster. The top five dogs that were clean in the final were all within half a second of each other. The standard is getting crazy good. Right. right. And that is incredible. And I remember even talking a little bit last year about maybe the courses are too easy for these guys. I looked at the courses again and the course was not easy. Like it required technical parts. It's just that everybody knew exactly what to do every single time. For example, the jump is like a 180 turn from the jump to the dog walk entry, right? People are controlling that turn. Right. So, you know, the less experienced competitor, they're just going to put the dog over it. There's no obvious off course. You're going to let the dog go wide or whatever. But you, you guys were out there like fighting for a tight turn just to set up this dog walk. And these are the little things that make such a difference. At the end, I noticed that you front cross on the jump right before that last line. Again, tightening up that turn, whereas, you know, maybe one of the other handlers I saw decided to handle it with dog on left, the handler moves to the right. And then, you know, the dog goes a little bit wide there. And those are the very subtle things that people aren't going to notice unless you're fighting for every tenth of a second. But just I felt like everybody was making the right decisions. The handlers were very, very mobile, uh, male or female, younger or older. Like the, the handling was just really um, on point. So I'll ask you the question again this year. Should, should we be making the courses a little bit harder at least for this specific competition at, at Cross, I feel like it's a little, it's a, there's too many dogs too close together. I always think the courses should be harder at, at these events. Um, but I can see why they make them easier. We have such a big spectator, a spectator crowd there mm-hmm. that they want to see dogs go clear and it's exciting for them to cheer them down the home straight. Um, I would say this year was probably harder than previous years. Um, there was I definitely agree. skills needed in there. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I always think it's cool to test skills. I love to train my dogs really hard skills like tough weave entries and exits and stuff. So I would like to see more of that. But I don't know whether or not that's what Crufts is about. Interesting. So Jennifer, you've competed at Westminster, kind of a similar situation where you have to kind of deal with the audience and you've also meddled um, at the uh, Agility World Championship where, you know, those courses aren't really made for the general viewing audience. So can you talk a little bit about the differences and let's get your opinion on uh, this as well. I kind of agree with regard to the fact that like Westminster is an event a little bit more geared towards the spectator. Um, It's really almost the only agility televised event we have here in the United States. And so I think it is very exciting if you have um, either a lot of dogs running clean, but really pushing the clock because it gets the spectators really cheering in the end Mm. of the course. I mean, if everybody Mm. faults in the first half, by the time the dog gets near that final line, everybody knows, oh, well, they're not the winner. Um, Or what Uh. we saw this year, and I don't know if it was an intentional thing or not, but we saw the trickiest part of the course in the last three obstacles. So mm-hmm. I think that really keeps people on the edge of their seats. And I think as an exhibitor, um, you know, as a competitor, it kind of keeps you on your toes the whole way through as well. Um, I know in past years, the finals course um, at Westminster has had some easier lines at the finish. Um, I think it was, I don't know if it was last year or the year before, where it's just kind of like a weave and three jumps. There's really nothing technical. By the time I got to the weaves, I thought, okay, we got this straight on out where this year there was no letting up until you were over the last jump. So I think you do have to kind of look at, you know, what is the event geared towards very different than AWC, which is not at all geared towards the spectator. In my opinion, Um, it is the world championships. It is testing the best of the best and the the top level competitors. So they're not there to please the crowd. You know, they don't care what the the crowd thinks about the course. They're there to test the skill of the dogs and the handlers. Mm -hmm. Um, And so there's, I don't think any of those things are taken into account at the course. Um, you know, the spectators are always involved at the world championships because it is our sport. We're not watching, we're spectators and competitors. We have a vested interest in the outcome of the results more so than somebody who's looking for a Saturday evening entertainment and they come over to Westminster to watch and then they don't watch dog agility or follow dog agility again for the next year. So I think You both of those events have crowd participation, not to the level. I mean, I don't think Westminster is anywhere close to the level of Crofts. I know it's not, but um, both of them very different in terms of kind of the competitor aspect. And I think what the organizers are trying to do with regard to course design. Yeah. Yeah. So, Dan, um, very interesting. I noticed that you ran not last, but third to last. And Dave had the honor of running last. How did they determine the running order for the final? 
So we have two qualifying rounds. We have a jumping round and an agility round. Uh, and then you run in seed of your combined results. So I think I was second in the jumping. Uh, Dave won it. And I trained my contacts in the agility round because I kind of knew I was in a good position. I just needed to ah. run feet. Uh, so I ran third from the end. And I think Dave maybe maybe came second in the agility. So he's running later. Um, but I like the position I was running in. I always hate running last. Um, <laughs> I liked my position. It was good. <laughs> I'm with you. I don't like running last either. So I you had a good it. position. Yes. Yeah. You get to put a little bit of pressure on people when you run with a few dogs left to go. That's true. Yeah. C- create mistakes yes. for, from the uh, other competitors. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. That's so interesting. So given the level of competition, given the quality of the dogs, when you ran clean and you took over the lead, did you feel like, oh, we're, we're definitely going to win or, or <laughs> in your mind, you were like, you know, if, if those other dogs run clean, we could definitely lose. So um, my reaction when we ran clean was so over the top, but it was mainly, <laughs> it was mainly because I was so out of breath. I'm really unfit. <laughs> so I was so out of breath at the end, I like collapsed in a heap on the floor. <laughs> and then there's this slow motion clip of me like over the top hands on head this wasn't because I th- thought I was going to win this was just because I couldn't believe we'd beaten the dogs that had already uh, ran before us yeah. so I was like celebrating that I know that uh, Dave was running fame after us and Geek and Fame were always getting really close time so I definitely couldn't celebrate there and the other dog running after us was Ewan and he won the individual round at the yeah. World Championships this year he had year. a huge so, week Yeah. so I was thinking I'm more than happy to come third you know I'm celebrating <laughs> here um but yeah, we were, we didn't realize we were going to win at this point. Man, that is phenomenal. And did, were you able to go back and watch the, the televised event? Like, did you go back on YouTube and, and w- hear what the announcers were talking about for you guys? Yes, I, went, I came home that night and watched it uh, on YouTube. <laughs> Man, that is awesome. So your, for your part, yeah, it was fantastic. They were saying all these things about you. But I noticed when Dave ran, I'll just put this out there. So apparently fame is eight. And yeah. they were talking like fame was going to, you know, retire tomorrow. They were like, and this could be the end, end of the road for Dave. <laughs> you know, he's washed up and over the hill. What, what did you, yeah. what did you think Maybe about that? Maybe they were that? talking more about Dave's age than fame's. I'm not oh, sure. But, uh, yeah. but we hope for fame that, that she has more years in her. We always retire our dogs when they still look good. Uh, we hate yep, to see yep. dogs uh, running past their best. Fame's, Fame, and I, I hope people believe the same for Geek as well, uh, are some of the dogs that will go down in, in British agility as, as the legends. And I would hate for them to be remembered as slow dogs that um, were maybe putting an extra stride so they didn't used to before. Um, so we certainly don't have plans to retire her now. I'm, I have every, uh, every hope that she'll be at Crofts again mm-hmm. next year. Um, but, but yeah, at, at eight, we still value and kind of think, thank goodness they're still running so well. <laughs> Right. Sure, sure. And then I guess I'll I'll um, close the thinking, my line of thought on how amazing the UK handlers have been over the last year or two at this particular competition and say that, um, you know, hopefully once everything gets going again, once we, I, I, I personally don't think that there's going to be an Agility World Championship this year, FCI. I have right. no insider information. They just I, it's canceled, just my prediction. They just today canceled the European Open right. for so those you, who don't know. So there's yeah, no yeah. European that Open. That was supposed year. to be in the UK. So I understand that that's, you know, and a, in loss, July. a loss for British agility there. Yeah, so we, we were to be the host. We were so excited to have the event here. Uh, we've had really cool uh, committee working to, working to put the event on. Um, so yeah, we're absolutely gutted that we can't ho- host it now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's nowhere in the world that can host it, you know, in July. So it's not a knock against the UK that they have to cancel. Hopefully they'll let you, when Agility gets going again, maybe they'll just let you uh, do it for 2021 or 2022, whenever we start uh, these big international competitions I mean, competitions those years again. are already set, so I don't know that oh, it would work that way, yeah. but, but uh, who knows? Maybe but, one day. Yeah, yeah. But the point is, once once this stuff blows over and we do resume agility trials, I think you have a young, a young generation of dogs, because some of these dogs are, are much younger, right, than uh, Geek. Yeah, we have, um, I would say Geek and Fame were possibly two of the oldest dogs in the yeah. event this year that, that I noticed. We have some incredible young dogs coming up through the gates. Yeah. Like I said, we have uh, Ewan's dog. He won the individual round at the World Championships this year. Um, 
We have, just to pluck another one, Nara Cuddy's young dog. Um, and these dogs are, in my opinion, more than capable of winning uh, at the World Championships. Yeah. Uh, Dave and I, we have young dogs coming up through the grades. When we time them against Geek and Fame, they're taking seconds off of them. Um, so for me, they're super exciting as well. So yeah, I think things are looking exciting over here. Yeah, and I feel like you guys have you know been uh, uh, leaders in, uh, I don't want to say... Uh, updating, maybe evolving uh, British agility, you know, in terms of handling as well to uh, better compete on the European style courses. Well, that I'll, is I'll very that kind way. of you to say that. I think it got to a point where we were looking at world, world championships maybe seven years ago and we were thinking this way is not good enough now. So we uh, invited Lisa Frick over for a mm-hmm. seminar and then everything changed. Um, We kind of were amazed by her handling and her theory behind things. Um, So she really got things started for us. Yeah. Yeah. And for uh, listeners who new to the podcast, Lisa Frick, four-time world champion with her legendary border collie, Haas. I want to say she won it like four out of five years or maybe even four in a row. Something like that, yeah. Yeah. But uh, phenomenal. Um, Let me get the country right. I think it's Austria. Yes. Did I get it right? Okay. Very good. Uh, very cool. All right. Now, Jennifer had, uh, I, I think Jennifer had a contact question for you. She was asking me and I was like, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to this. Well, I think you already answered it, but, uh, my question was with regard to your A-frame, but you already kind of mentioned that in the preliminary rounds, you were training it a bit, but, um, you know, I know you have the stopped contacts and I watched all those runs back very closely. And there was a couple runs that it was very obvious that you had a stop, but then in the, I believe it was the singles finals geek did this beautiful, what would appear to be beautiful running A-frame. I mean, he jumped the apex, two hits on the downside, okay. exited right off. And I thought maybe he has two behaviors that are verbally cued that you have the stop that you did in the preliminaries and then, um, you know, a different verbal cue for running it for the finals. But it sounds like that was maybe not the case. You were just pushing a little bit, releasing a little earlier. Yeah, I really, really wish I had running contacts. I think the running contacts, he would be capable of of everything, I really think. Um, But I've tried retraining the running A-frame last winter uh, and he's the only downside of him being such a good dog and he's so desperate to please is once he knows his job to change it was so stressful for him. He was like, mm. why, why, why have I got to run through this? Um, and I'm a bit of a baby as well. I hate to see him fail. So <laughs> I stuck with the stop. Um, and, and yeah, in the, in the finals, I just release as soon as he touches. And I agree in the singles final more so than the championship final it was a perfect running a frame. I have it was beautiful. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. beautiful split I was very happy with that. <laughs> All right. Well, I was just I was just following up on that. I was like, maybe it's two two behaviors <laughs> getting real fancy on us. All right. So my <laughs> other question. So I was uh, supposed to come over for the International Agility Festival this year, and it was kind of a goal of mine is to try to go to Cross someday. And it doesn't appear that that will be happening this year. But did they change the jump heights? Is there a new change to the jump heights going forward? Because with Pink, uh, she doesn't jump 24 here in the United States. And I was was told that there's an intermediate jump height that you guys are adding. Tell us a bit about that, if my facts are correct on that. Yeah, so uh, this is brand new for this year. So it it started in January. We now have four jump heights. So we work in centimeters, so I'm I'm not good with the inches. That's okay. okay. (laughs) We had a... 35 centimeters for small, 45 for medium, and 65 for large. So everything was five centimeters bigger than what you have at the FCI competitions. Those have all dropped down to go in line with uh, FCI World Championships. And we also have a fourth extra height for those dogs that are um, that were the small largest, so they're in between medium and large. Uh, they have to be under 50 centimeters. And it's the coolest change for agility. It, it makes watching dogs that before you would watch jump and think, those dogs aren't loving it and now they are looking so cool so yeah mm. that's so 50 50 centimeters is 19.68 inches so now that's that's consistent with wao is that correct so now you guys have the yes. same four jump heights as w okay that's what yeah. i thought so because pink jumps uh 500 in wao so she would would be that intermediate jump height. So very cool. That's exciting. I, of course, obviously am hugely in favor of that, having a very small <laughs> border collie who's too big for medium, but uh, too small to really do the large ones. So that's very exciting to look forward to in future years. Yeah, mm. definitely. And I really hope more countries follow suit and then eventually the world. That would be so cool. 
Yeah, that would be awesome. That's very interesting. And now the FCI will have a little bit of time on their hands to, uh, be, as we all do, be thinking about that. So we have all this time on our hands. I understand that uh, Geek and Fame are seven and eight. So surely there must be young dogs to talk about. Like how, how's, the, how, how's the next generation of uh, dogs looking in that household? <laughs> so our two young dogs um, are litter mates. They are three. Their dad is Geek. So we bred uh, from one of our bitches to Geek and kept two of the puppies. I took a bitch. Dave kept a dog. Um, and uh, I'm hopefully not being biased. I think both are really special dogs. Uh, Commotion, Dave's one, has is basically a clone of Geek. He's Mr. Perfect. He hates to go wrong. He's going to be the seven out of seven clears dog. Um, and then mm-hmm. I have Boffin, who is uh, the wild child of the litter. Um, insanely fast, probably <laughs> making me run more than I would like to. Um, maybe not going to be my seven out of seven clear dog, but I think when she does go clear, she's going to be exceptional. Yeah, that's awesome. That is awesome. And so um, what is kind of your uh, plan? I know it's hard to make plans with so much uncertainty out there, but I assume that these dogs had not yet started a trial or they had just started the lower levels they just started lower level. So we have seven uh-huh. grades over here in the UK. Dave's has already won into grade five and a half. Oh my goodness. So he's done really well. Uh, and mine is four and a half. So in their okay. first few shows, they've already won a minimum of like five or six competitions. Uh-huh. So they're doing really well. So are you taking this opportunity to kind of look at your strengths and weaknesses and shore up those weaknesses or like, how are you, what is different about the way you are going to train on your own now, you know, besides the very obvious things, like, are you changing the focus of your training for at least the next several, uh, you know, months? Yes. Um, Our aim is going to be that both of these young dogs can come out. We're not going to have many competitions left this year, if any. Um, Right. So our aim will be that those dogs can come out, get to our highest grade as quickly as possible. And if possible, it would be amazing to be sat here talking about them next year as the Crufts winners. I don't know how possible it will be to get them to Crufts next year now. Um, But it would be great to use these three, four months that we're going to be having no trials for to get them ready for the very top of the game, possibly even world championships, if that's possible, would would be really great. Yeah. And for everybody listening, I think that's a a phenomenal uh, blueprint, right? It's a really great attitude to have, you know, you, you don't have all these trials. You're, you're not able to uh, progress and, and get those things on the trial side, but there's a lot of work to be done on the practice field, right? That's where the magic is made, right? The trials are really just to test our skills, but all that skill development is going to happen in the practice field. And as much as possible, uh, you want to be uh, doing that. And so what are you doing for um, basically like your students, like people who are coming in live, like what's that situation like as far as, um, you know, let, let's say I'm a competitor over there and I train with you guys and I don't have my own equipment, my own field. Like that, that's pretty tough. Yeah, so um, we've obviously at the moment have our online classrooms. So we have for the students mm-hmm. that have got access to equipment, they're able to do that. At the moment, everything's cancelled. So even one to ones, we're not doing them. So if people don't have their own equipment, their dogs can just have a little bit of a rest. And and to be honest, I think it's worth mentioning that that's what I'm going to do with Geek now. Um, he worked really hard at crafts and before crafts. We have nothing to aim for now for three months. So I'm going to give him four weeks of just being a dog, no agility nice. training, keeping him fit. Um, uh, and then we'll come back to it in a month's time. Um, and that's, there's, there's no injury. There's nothing there for him to rest. I just think it's really important that he's seven, like we've mentioned a few times, he can just recover. So I've said to some of my students, there is no harm in your dogs having a break. I'm not a believer in drilling dogs all the time. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great perspective to have. And so hopefully people listening to this um, are encouraged. Sure, it's a, it's a break that maybe you weren't expecting or anticipating, but um, it's here and, you know, it can be a very, very uh, good thing. So you, you mentioned teaching online. So I want to let people have a chance to connect with uh, you and uh, Dave online 
for uh, instructions. I know you guys put videos out there and certainly they can at least see your runs. We will put a link to your compilation video in our show notes page and uh, to your training site. So what is the website for everybody? So uh, my classrooms are done via Facebook. So just drop me a message on Facebook. You should be able to find me uh, if you search for Dan Shaw. Um, and I do classes for the seesaw and for start lines uh, at the moment uh, and for puppies. Um, and Dave has classes for literally everything. Threadles, contacts, weaves, handling. Um, and they're available via the QME website, uh, www.qmeagility.com. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, so between us, we cover everything. So over the next three months, you can train everything you need to for when trials start again. That is awesome. And maybe I shouldn't have mentioned Dave because, you know, like I said, if he wanted us to talk about him, <laughs> he, he should have won. So. Uh, that's okay. Dave's a friend. Dave's a friend of the podcast. So you know, he gets a little shout out. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Dan. We're super excited to have you on again. And congratulations on an amazing year at Crufts. Thank you so much for having me. And that's it for this week's podcast. We'd like to thank our sponsors, hitaboard.com and 1TDC.com. Happy training. I've always thought my neighbors were nice people, but then they put a password on their Wi-Fi.